Fantastic. Welcome all uh, to the Flood Expo Digital Focus webinar of the day, which is an evaluation of model-led retrofit suds. A couple of housekeeping notes. We are recording today for an on-demand option in a few days' time, uh, and there will be two poll questions that you can all engage with uh, today, which is also quite exciting, which will show um, in the middle of the screen, and you can select your options. Uh, we would love to hear from you uh, for the Q&A section at the end, of which you'll be able to find um, at the bottom of your screen uh, in the Q&A section if you just um, give that uh, a click as well. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank and introduce our webinar sponsor of today, which is Innovise, an Autodesk company. And representing Innovise is Ruth Clark, the Water Innovation Manager. Ruth is a civil engineer who has worked with software for the water industry for over 25 years. During her career, Ruth has been involved in a wide range of projects from flood risk assessments and real-time flood forecasting studies through to the development of smart water and wastewater analytics platforms. Ruth has recently rejoined Innovise as a Water Innovation Manager, having previously worked at the company for 15 years. So welcome, Ruth. And our, Simon, our speaker today will be Simon, Simon Ainley, uh, the Technical Director at Arcadis, um, based in Plymouth. Simon is responsible for managing and developing the integrated urban drainage team in, in the UK, facilitating the delivery of drainage improvement schemes flood risk assessments, asset management, sustainable drainage investigations, and strategic hydrological catchment studies for a range of companies, including Southwest Water, uh, Southern Water, Thames Water, Wessex Water, the Qatar government, the Bahrain government, the Environment Agency, and local authorities. Um, I'll hand over to Ruth to uh, set the scene on Innovise before Simon presents um, his evaluation for today's webinar. So thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome uh, to today's webinar, which, um, as mentioned, explores the topic of model-led retrofit SUDs. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to Innovise, after which I'm going to hand over to our speaker, Simon, who's obviously the main event today. So um, he is an associate technical director, and he'll be talking us through some of the work he's carried out using Innovise's InfoWorks ICM software. Before I start, um, I'd like to carry out the first of um, the two poll questions, just to get a feel of who's attending the, the uh, webinar today. So if you would be able to um, answer that poll, uh, once I've uh, stopped speaking, we'll be able to um, just look at the answers to that. So that has appeared now. So if you could select one of those answers um, in a couple of minutes, we'll be able to collate those uh, answers and um, be able to give you an overview of who's who's in the audience. So um, a quick introduction to Innovise. Um, as many of you will know, uh, Innovise is a software company that's been in the business of providing solutions to the problems faced in the water industry for quite a number of decades. Um, if you could pop to the next slide, Simon, please. Um, I'm not sure if people can see the slide, actually, because I think the poll is probably <laughs> over the top of it. However, never mind. Um, so the areas in which Innovise work cover the entire water cycle. Um, we provide tools that help users design and analyze uh, water, wastewater and stormwater networks. We uh, provide tools that help uh, manage those assets from pro proactive planning um, to reactive maintenance. And we do cover all the way through to sort of near, near real-time platforms for operational decision-making. So the subject of today's presentation to, is to look at the use of software, to look at the possibility of retrofitting SUDs within challenging urban environments. So these solutions allow users to assess different designs at the site level to ensure that they meet local planning requirements, but also with the added ability to, to look at how they impact the larger network into which they'll fit. Um, so that's all I really want to say about Innovise at the moment. Um, do we have the answers to, to that poll? Just so we can get a good feel of, of who is in the audience. So, well, that's quite a, an overwhelming majority of consultants um, who, who are here today. So thank you very much for, for completing that. Um, just a couple of other things before I hand over to Simon. Um, uh, if you do have any questions as Simon goes through his presentation, it'd be great if you could... Um, provide those in the Q&A chat, which is at the, at the bottom. Um, and without further ado, I will hand over to Simon, who can uh, give us information about the retrofit SEDS. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, thank you for the, for the setup and the introduction. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to give a, a very a bit of a generic talk about um, some of the work we've been doing recently on retrofit suds. Uh, this is very specific in London. And this talk um, kind of is a, a follow on to a talk I gave about a year ago um, on what was called the London Strategic Suds Pilot Project, which is effectively the, the ancestor to the work I want to talk about now. Um, so this, this is kind of a natural follow on to that, um, to that project and what I shared before. Uh, and I just want to provide a bit of an overview of the sort of things we looked at um, in the modelling environment, how we used InfoWorks ICM to address some of the challenges in looking at scale and looking at the complexities of, of retrofit, and then how we ultimately kind of presented the results, how we used that data to provide the clients with valuable um, insight into, into investments in retrofit. And I'll finish up with obviously some lessons, but some of my thoughts about the next steps where I would like to see this going and where I think as an industry we could potentially take this uh, using platforms like Innovise um, to move this kind of piece forward. Which effectively is the agenda I've just talked about. I've got ahead of myself. Um, so just to reiterate on point three, so the, the work I'm really talking about is what we're calling the Lambeth and Enfield SUDS assessments. Um, that's because those two boroughs kind of were partaking of the project and that's the focus of the of the efforts in terms of the, the, uh, the geography. Um, for anybody on the call who's, who's not uh, local, they're in London. So just want to focus quickly on when we talk about SUDS, what, what we've actually focused on and what we mean. Um, in the project, we've kind of coalesced around what we've termed as public realm SUDS retrofit. Um, and the best example is just to show some images. These are all projects in London um, that have been sort of completed in recent um, recent years. This is really a focus around developing and implementing small scale nature based solutions in and around the public highway and the public realm space. There's a lot of opportunity for this, and this is really a focus on these kind of infrastructure features specifically. Um, everyone, most people, well, not everyone, most people will be able to, be able to kind of um, guess or judge the general benefits of of retrofit uh, for these type of features. Um, I, we've not gone into detail about all of these, fo these focus points, um, but ultimately the, what we're trying to achieve with all of these projects, it's not detailed design, it's not the, the complexity of that, it's trying to justify where's the best place to invest and what's the likely benefits of investing to give local authorities uh, and water administra administrators the ability to select good investments, to plan in the long term, and ultimately to try and get this kind of intervention delivered at scale, because it's going to address some of our larger challenges in, in society around biodiversity and net zero carbon, climate change. We're going to have to deliver these things at scale. And in London, as made a, as in that bottom point there, if you look at the available space that you could deliver these, there could potentially be billions of pounds worth of investment that is available to deliver. The vast majority of that is probably not the most ideal thing to deliver. Um, we want to find the stuff that is the most ideal thing to deliver. So that's sort of the, the background to what we're really focusing on and the type of suds when I'm talking about suds in, in the project. Just a quick back step. So the predecessor of the work I want to talk about now, which I did talk about before, and people who were part of that or can see the webinar may, may recognize these, um, but I just think it's a useful setup for these projects and the work we've done before. Um, this project was started in 2018. It was quite a, a, a wide scaled endeavor. It was a pilot. We did do a lot of investigation. We did a lot of trial and error methods to try and, um, to try and understand what we were doing. But ultimately we're just looking at trying to derive an evidence base of the financial benefits of retrofit and ideally retrofitting at scale. So not individual features, but delivering um, many, many years of continuous in intervention. Um, the objectives, as I had down there, is to look at, look at the modelling environment. So bring it back to models, we need to use the modelling environment to look at these. The complexity of the, of the urban environment require that kind of consideration. Um, and we looked at various different methods on how you could model and how you could assess SUDS, um, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. Uh, but ultimately, we wanted to develop a bit of a financial case that can be used by local authorities to invest in, in retrofit, and not just now, but a continuous investment going into the future. 
Um, and then just a quick, this slide here just quickly covers some of the outcomes of that work um, that uh, this is all freely available online. But a lot of the outcomes of this were, uh, the core outcomes were a good demonstration that um, you could achieve a significant cost benefit return for a lot of locations. Um, you could generate a lot of investment, but the most, um, the most noteworthy point of, that came out of this work was the value and almost necessity to target where you invest in, in Bruggen infrastructure, where you invest in sustainable drainage systems um, to get the best return on your investment. So the two bars in the bottom left, what we looked at through all the modeling, through all the assessments for various different sites across London, we, would, we, we evaluated that roughly 50% of all the flood damages we could prevent through this kind of uh, investment would largely be delivered by only about 2% of the potential opportunity. So 2% of the, of the public realm environment. So that is what you really need to find. That, that 50%, roughly 50%, that is the, what the effort that we need to make. And that's what the modeling I've done in these projects I'll talk about today is really focused on finding those sites. Um, as is as mentioned, um, oh, actually it's not in the slide, as, a, as, we, as we derived just for three boroughs there could be in the order of, of, of several billions of pounds worth of potential schemes you could deliver. However, there's no point if you don't know which ones are really giving you your, your return by your flood mitigation, um, which is really driving these projects. So following the completion of, of that project, it was about a two year project of several stages. At the end of the project, we did identify several um, limitations and assumptions we had to make through the project that we wanted to see if we could address um, and funding was was found and made available and then we could actually commit to doing some work for two follow-on boroughs um, Lambeth and Enfield and, and that gave birth to these Lambeth and Enfield sub assessments um, which we undertook basically concurrently um, but they effectively have exactly the same method same approach so I'm only going to talk about them I'm not going to talk geographically between the two I'll just talk about them together so we wanted to take the next technical step um, from those past projects and from the lessons we learned and the recommendations we made from those um, the first one was really around scale so the more we looked at this the more we realized that when you focus in on a small area it's very hard to see the bigger picture it's hard to see how things connect and interact scale is what provides the value not only not only about the technical aspects of what SUBS does, but also when boroughs and even large organizations such as the water companies are looking at much more significant areas and they want to focus, they need to be able to take a holistic approach and look at things at a, a top down scale. So any sort of assessment like this needs to function very well at the scale that it's going to be used. In this case, it's for the local boroughs. So we, we kind of made sure we were zoomed out to scale, uh, suitable scale for it. Um, as I've sort of alluded, addressing the limitations of the previous project was a, was, a, was a key driver. We want to continuously innovate and develop this. I think this is a, a fairly um, young place, a young realm we're developing into. There's lots of different avenues you can take for this. So we wanted to kind of see if we can take the next step, address any of those limitations. Um, and as a, su a supplementary factor for this, beyond doing a sort of uh, the pilot study, which is more sort of technical, almost academic in some areas, this now wants to drift into something far more practical and usable so that um, so the planners, um, investment managers, um, engineers, even policy makers at this level can start using it practically to focus investment and to focus planning. So around the limitations, the key limitations that we really wanted to look at um, were catchment variability. So the fact that when we looked at the original projects, we tried to see if there was, there was commonality um, across different types of catchments in terms of different benefits, but it became very obvious that actually the dynamics of urban environments, especially like London, means you need, really need to look at every single site independently and do some form of assessment to understand the connectivity of flow, the nature of runoff, the impact of the drainage systems under the ground and how they all work together. Um, the optimization challenges, I've called it. So I've, I mentioned before, the core focus of this is all around prioritizing investment, i.e. finding the best sites. So optimizing where you, where you want to deliver, that is one of the biggest challenges we've found before. 
um, because of a what we call a many-to-many -many relationship, which I'll talk about in a second, and trying to not solve that, but providing better solution for that. Um, and quality versus quantity is is effectively something we I, I, I term as the balance you have to strike between doing lots of technical modeling and assessment to get a really high accurate answer versus the amount of time, effort and cost it takes to deliver that. And what, we, what we've looked at is that, and in our modeling assessment, you'll see in a second, the challenge is doing very complex modeling is costly, um, takes a lot of time and investment. And when you do it at scale, it just grows almost exponentially beyond that. And then assessing retrofit where there are lots of opportunities requires lots of simulations and very quickly you end up flying down to the bottom in terms of running out of time having no money and not being able to generate anything practical to use so there's a balance to be struck in here and this is what we've attempted to achieve with these projects and sort of demonstrate whether that's something that others could use um, elsewhere um, and in terms of result sharing that's the other side of this is demonstrating how we can take what we do in, in InfoWorks and take the sort of the analysis we do in, in GIS as well that supports that and provide it in a platform that can be digested and used again by policymakers and planners, but also enable collaboration. That's collaboration internally within boroughs and across different organizations. So we sort of explore that as well, which is not really directly ICM, but it's just sort of built upon it. So I will touch on it in this. In this. So technical workflow, how we went through this project, how we proposed to go through, through these two assessments. Um, and this is just an overview, and there's a lot of nuance of this that I can't cover today. Um, so the first step was to try and identify opportunities, opportunities being literally the parcels of land, the potential sites in and around the landscape, which, which um, utilized the several GIS workflows. And we basically clustered them together, as you can see there, into these kind of groups of, of potential um, opportunity sites, strips of pavement, um, verges, highway verges, um, sort of traffic management systems and things like that, just so we have a, an understanding of where we could deliver. Then we associated all of these sites with the flood predictions. I'll talk about the modeling in a sec. I'm, I'm skipping over that quickly for a reason. Um, now this was delivered through what we've sort of termed as one and a half D modeling or 1.5 D modeling. It's cheesy. I admit, but I couldn't think of a better description for it. Um, we then look at use this modeling to understand wet spots, to do calculations of flood damages. We also did some supplementary 2D modeling to get a bit more accuracy in, in flood depths versus property damages. And then we can understand where these wet spots were in, in the model. And by doing that, you can then kind of effectively connect all of your opportunity sites with where the wet spots are, because they then trace down your network. Um, and the, the actual suds themselves were modeled in the network, uh, in the surface, in the, in the, um, the model 1D links, which again I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and we used extensive scenarios in ICM, which is a very, a very powerful functionality in ICM that we use a lot. Um, and we automated the creation of those scenarios using SQLs because we had to create hundreds of them. And those scenarios are used to understand the variability of how you potentially could implement suds. In terms of different locations and different scales, etc. Once that was all done, we run uh, an extensive suite of simulations. Uh, we had some data specialists write some Python scripts, um, which I'm definitely not going to go through in this call. Um, and that was really focused on trying to then associate the the sort of prevalence of of sub sites in different streets with the benefits of these wet spots. So by kind of doing statistical correlations between the model predictions and where the different scenarios had assumed we could deliver such um, opportunities in. And ultimately that would derive a, a sort of relationship network between the two, where you could see that certain features featured very heavily in highly performing scenarios, i.e. they delivered much more benefit for, for local wet spots and convert the other, the other side is converse when they're, when they're not associated. And then ultimately once we've gone through that process, which again is much more complicated than I can actually explain, I think today, um, we were able to look at sort of the net benefit across the catchment, associate it with all the various wet spots, and then distribute that back up into the catchment, distribute it to individual suds sites and opportunities. As I said, we've got a network, so you can trace it up, work out the influence. But once you have that, you have a knowledge of um, things like cost benefit calculations, which obviously are quite instrumental for 
planning and generating in, uh, investment for any form of water um, management intervention. And ultimately, as I mentioned, we, we presented the results in a, a GIS platform, which I'll briefly show you later, um, just to show the, 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 thru, the, the throughput of information from the start to the end. This is just a quick slide to demonstrate the, when I mentioned about associating benefit, this is sort of demonstrating, I think, the key or the core challenge that I've been trying to look through and I think is a big challenge around this kind of infrastructure and assessing it and how you use things like ICM to assess them. Um, just sticking with a very simple example, in many what I call traditional drainage projects, be that a storage tank or a sewer or something like that, um, you typically would may have a solution, which is, is the tank, which is addressing a problem, which is a place that's flooding, whether it's a single flooding place, a manhole, a series of manholes, uh, flooding the park or even flooding of a river. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's a fairly simple relationship. Retrofit opportunities present a very different environment. There are many, many solutions across the potential catchment that could connect to many, many different locations of flooding. And that connection can be directly, or it can be next to the flooding, it can be three or four streets down from the flooding, it could be the fact that the water goes into the sewer and then down the sewer down a different direction and pops up, comes out somewhere else, and there's flooding. Delivering interventions in all these different places can deliver benefits in, in several places elsewhere. And then the relationship between which ones you deliver in which streets makes it even more complex. So it makes it very hard to do a direct comparison. Um, which is why it's very difficult to justify doing very complex 1D, 2D integrated modeling of large areas, because you have to look at how you may consider doing multiple simulations and the time and cost constraints um, quickly prevent that being feasible way forward. I mean, so the solution, as I allude to, is, is just simulations, running more simulations to try and get more information from those different relationships that you can then use statistically to try and associate opportunities and solutions with, with benefits. So protection of flooding. Um, and then from that, you can actually derive, you can associate, sorry, benefit um, those areas with individual sites or individual sections of roads. And that helps the whole process of trying to find the optimal sites, the optimal locations, because you've used a data-driven process to do this. So to get to that point, as I, as I mentioned, there's several modeling approaches and just to quickly run through the uh, a bit of an overview of, of the strategy for this and, and what we've done in the past. So 1D, 2D modeling, fully integrated modeling is sort of something we've used in the past several times. Obviously it's, it's prevalent everywhere and especially for surface features where you're trying to intercept surface sort of runoff. 1D, 2D modeling has a lot of value um, and ultimately is kind of the gold standard for the getting the accuracy sometimes and the precision of what you want to do. So you include all those features. However, inevitably it can be complex um, and it can produce very long simulation times, depending on what you're running, and especially in very dense urban environments like London. London has the, also has a specific challenge that a lot of the combined sewer system is very large and extensive. So if you just do one catchment, for example, Lambeth, Lambeth sits on one of the major combined catchments. And even if you just model Lambeth itself, you still need to include a lot of the combined network, which is under the ground, which flows east to west and covers an enormous chunk of South London. So you end up with models that are fairly large by default, just by the way they are connected. Another, another attitude is, and we look, use this a little bit before in, in the previous study, the, the pilot study is just use the 2D model only. So you just focus on the surface, you forget the network underneath, you just focus on interception and runoff, um, which has its value. Um, it's much quicker, to, well, no, it's not much quicker to run, it can be quicker to run, and much simpler to build typically than, than one or two networks. However, it still will have a time association with it. It's much harder to associate locations with other locations because of the nature of this kind of model. And obviously we are kind of missing and omitting the impact of having a connected drainage system and how that may affect things. Um, the a specific example in Enfield is that several um, open channel systems that go through the catchment because it's sort of towards the, the northern boundary of the urban area, um, which obviously have a significant conveyance capacity. And if those sort of features are not really included, you are definitely missing some of that interconnected nature of delivering um, retrofit, retrofit suds. So where we ended up looking at is, again, my cheesy 1.5D modeling approach, which effectively is 1D modeling, but it just pulls in more components than typically we do in most 1D modeling. So by that, I mean, 
We have the sewer system. We include the highway drainage system and surface runoff, but all in the 1D realm. Um, so we represent all the features of that so that we can run the model in a 2D, uh, sorry, a 1D only environment, which makes it run much simpler and much faster than traditional. But we hopefully include a lot of the more complex overland interconnections and we can directly associate wet spots, which would occur typically on the highway and places like that, with our sun's opportunities, which are all built into the network in the 1D network. So that's really what we've we focused on. Um, and ultimately, so we kind of set ourselves a minimum requirement is to enable the scale, again, large scale. We've looked at relatively, Enfield is a relatively large borough. Um, so scale in this 1D environment is much easier. I think the model run in about 12 minutes. I think the 2D only model we produced for that took something in the order of an hour. So a 1D, 2D model, I'm not going to guess, but it's going to be longer than that. Um, yeah, the ability to run scenarios, lots of scenarios, and that also requires the model to be set up in a way where it's fairly easy to adjust the sub features to you know create different features in different places. Um, it's not it doesn't require complex GIS to do that for hundreds of different scenarios. Um, and yeah, so we set ourselves those requirements, and that's where we sort of approached on this one and a half D modeling. And there is a um, snapshot of sort of what it looks like during the simulation. It's difficult to show you the complexities of it, obviously, in this, this forum. Um, but effectively, as I say, we consolidated all the existing networks, the surface water, the combined networks. That effectively is the easy side of the modeling because most of those systems already exist. We just used what we had. But the, the, the new thing we did is creating what we call highway networks. And the reason why we focus so much on this, and we think this is a very justifiable method, is that for retrofit suds opportunities, we're really looking to manage and manage the runoff and, and impacts of water water on maybe more common rainfall events. So your one in twenties, your one in thirties, and it's less so much of an issue on your one in one hundreds or one in two hundreds or higher. So uh, uh, and at that point, your overland flows, your major flooding areas of rail infrastructure and across parks and through buildings becomes more of an issue and your 1D, 2D modeling environment then becomes much more important to get the accuracy and the precision. I appreciate that. But for this, we've accepted that we get to that sort of scale of event and this environment is suitable because the majority of flooding, typically, we retain largely within the highway and the immediate surrounding of most highways, being that the area where most of the paved area is, paved runoff is. Um, so we, we create the highway network from freely available um, mapping data um, OS open data. We created some automated workflows to, that would derive levels, assume uh, actually calculated road widths from the master map, added extra nodes, and created effectively a, a network that represents the road surface, including the pavements the water could travel across. Um, we then included a representation of the capacity of the highway drains. So this is where we've got a number of gullies. We can count the gullies. We create connections. I think we used orifice records with a proportionate um, sort of capacity, and that will allow flow to travel up and down um, the system in a realistic or so fashion. Um, we did include a number of overland flow routes um, that we did think were important. So this is where 2D modeling still comes into its own. So we used 2D modeling initially to get us an understanding of the dynamic of the surface. And we then included those features as, as physical 1D links based on what the 2D modeling was implying so that we maintain the the volume balance, we maintain the connectivity, and also we can assess how a individual location could potentially affect a wet spot if it had to travel over a park, for example, and not down the road to the highway system. And we also redefined subcatchments again to get our runoff. Um, we utilized existing model subcatchments where we could, but then we developed our own um, using things like uh, LIDAR and slope data to make sure it was a more realistic um, approach. But that's a very, subcatchments are a very common um, method. And then we undertook a benchmarking exercise whereby we compared this to existing 1D modeling to the existing flood maps that were available to the 2D modeling we undertook to associate the wet spot areas with generally where the 2D modeling implied those wet spots would be. And as you can see on the plan on the right, you've got several wet spots which are sort of typified by clusters of red nodes or red flooding in that case that's in the 1D realm. Um, and those, those areas we effectively clustered together and then we would calculate our damages and our impacts from those and then we would associate the upstream features with those wet spots. 
and that's like I said, a GIS process that sort of connects them downstream effectively. So ultimately, this sort of method we brought together because it provided us a consistency um, across the borough, um, which means we could apply it to large areas uh, in fairly common fashion. Um, and then when then we're looking at the outcomes, the value in different places, it's not, um, you, you can compare them directly and there's no sort of um, differences of, of approach. Enable us to do rapid simulations. So I think in the end, we did 750 simulations with this model, which was several different rainfall events across several different um, methods of, of implementing um, retrofit suds across several different scales, scales of intervention, i.e. if we, we consider sort of whether you could deliver, say, 5% of the opportunity and 10% and so on and so forth. So we got a very good dynamic understanding of the, so the association of how much suds you delivered and where you delivered suds with the actual wet spots themselves and the impacts. Uh, and as I've said, yeah, so it allowed us to directly connect them together using um, a GIS approach that sort of connects them through and based on you know, their, their downstream connectivity. Um, one thing I haven't touched on quickly, actually, I realise is, is actual sub representation themselves. So again, keeping this simple, which was the name of the game, um, suds are represented by using just single nodes. And those nodes we use, their, their sort of area was derived from the GIS data that I showed in the previous slide. So we have a realistic understanding of the potential area you could deliver for each node. And then when we developed all the scenarios, that area just was changed a little bit. So if it was 5%, it was 5% of the area and 10%, so on and so forth. Um, and then we just given a, a nominal depth to make sure we had a, a realistic volume. I think the depth is about 0.3 meters, which sort of represents what we think is a functional water depth for these type of features. So that's effectively how we modeled the SUDS environment and had all those everywhere. And the, the um, selection of scenarios just picked ones in different places accordingly and gave them different areas. Once we've kind of gone through all that process uh, and we finalized things, um, we, we got to the point where we wanted to present this. And this is really about making this stuff practical and pragmatic. As I said before, it's not about the detail and the complexity. It's about making it usable at a scale, at variable scales. This video is just running you through um, the, the platform we created and the sort of data you can see in there. Um, as you can see, you do, you could, we've defined road segments. And each road segment, you can calculate the uh, various different metrics that can be very useful in terms of the area of suds, the type of suds, um, their cost benefit, their cost, um, and any other metric you want to sort of calculate. This layer shows it in even more detail, so it actually picks up the very specific um, polygon areas that have been defined, and this is just color coded based on a, on a, a three tier classification at the moment. Um, so the, the dark blue is the most effective, so to speak, and in there you can see all the attributes that we had um, derived. The platform almost always allow, also allows you to um, interrogate the data more dynamically. Uh, again, this is the, the thing we were driving towards, providing insight that you can then slice into pieces so different things can be selected. You can choose where you want to focus your investment uh, and you can align these investments with different things. So you could, there is supplementary data in here around things like um, uh, the potential for infiltration, for example. So whether you need to build um, active drainage from your suds back to your system or you could rely on infiltration um, or there's layers around walking and cycling highways. So where there's opportunities to connect um, delivery of suds with with um, with sort of re regeneration projects looking to work on the highway to improve cycling access and various things like that. Um, and there's plenty more we could do with it. But this is sort of what we've achieved with this um, at this point. So that really. Um, brings me to the end of, of the real technical aspects of I think what we did and what we ended up with at the end of the day uh, through the project. Um, what I want to just move on to now is, is on my sort of lessons learned from the, from the process, um, the overall process. So it seems quite um, uh, a departure from, from the technical aspect, but what, I'm, what I think is very valuable from this and it's taught me is a thought about reframing um, the discussion around how we how we invest and how we assess suds uh, and individual features. Um, so we generally a lot of a lot of effort to, to generate investment and funding for features like this is is still done based on what you, you know a traditional flood mitigation measure. You build something, it costs money, 
you've got to demonstrate a return on investment. And once it's built, we move on to the next thing. Given the complexity of what you could do with SUDS, uh, SUDS retrofit and the extent of the opportunity um, and the fact that each individual feature is relatively small, there's always been a challenge to prove that kind of, that kind of um, return on investment for an individual in intervention. We need to start looking at it at a catchment scale and actually trying to get investment committed at a catchment scale. And I think that's all about trying to consider these figures more, these features more as sort of adaptation measures as opposed to a specific fluid indication measure. Not forgetting that these that these features deliver a whole raft of other blue green infrastructure benefits and natural capital benefits that are a lot of them nothing to do with flooding. Um, so that's just a it's it's a thought I've had, and I think it's important to kind of recognise it because it does take a little bit how we potentially could approach the modelling and assessment of this, so we can provide data to the to the authorities, um, planners, and policymakers to enable them to actually get investment sped up and really commit to this going forward um, and also it's not just a one-off scheme you know retro retrofitting sustainable drainage and blue infrastructure it needs to that effectively is non-stop so we need to add resilience through constant adaptation of our environment and, and not complex business case proposals for every little tiny feature you want to implement um, and as i said catchment based planning it's the need to zoom out to see things at a bigger scale and ultimately, I, I, I see an analogy to the energy sector and how diversification of energy sources, again, is a key thing I think we need to be looking at in urban environments and retrofit. So that's a great way to do that, bringing online um, measures all over the place that can take some of the slack and the more extreme pressures in between the need to invest in major infrastructure improvements, which will still always be there as well. This is definitely not a replacement. Um, and then the, you know, the, on the why side of this, that was more about you know, the how, but again, considering the full drainage system, um, as in the combined system, um, which is a very important factor in here. And we didn't really touch on this and what we've done so far. This is stuff for the next stage, I think, but there are some large major challenges, specifically in London, but in various other similar places around population growth and climate change, things like discharges from storm overflows and CSOs, and how potentially investments in retrofit at a large scale can deliver to those. But what we've got to do is provide platforms that enable the water companies to go back through to find those opportunities, which normally sit under the local authorities. So again, modeling environments and data creation that, that functions as a collaborative environment and not just a technical exercise to calculate cost benefit, for example. So my final, final slide is just on what I'm calling next steps. It's not specifically for me or for you or for anyone. I think it's just a, a thought experiment really on next steps for the industry and where I think I'd like to see things going. Um, in terms of the modeling specifically, I think I would like to see modeling like this become even more what I'm calling deterministic. So stepping away a little bit from doing lots and lots of predictive modeling instead of moving towards digital twin environments that actually look towards understanding the route and connectivity of flow from almost every surface in a catchment, and then using modeling information and predictions to effectively calibrate it and to train it. But once you've got that environment that works like this, it's much easier to be able to start picking at things and going, right, if I deliver something there, what does that do? How does that connection work? What I've done, what we've done so far, it doesn't, it's not dynamic like this. It doesn't have that kind of connection. It's just a one-off assessment. I think we need something more dynamic and more, um, more advanced to be honest um, and ultimately this helps you know demonstrate demonstrate the benefit of suds to every beneficiary so as i said in the previous slide that ability to collaborate is very important and the example being as i mentioned a cso so the ability for a water company to select a cso and to see fairly easily what its influencing catchment is where all the urban landscapes are that drain, that, that contribute to it, that will drain into, run off to, and drain into it one way or another, and potentially what the influence of the different areas are, because they're not all the same. They will vary depending on where they are. And if you can then overlay that with opportunities to deliver retrofit suds, you suddenly get a multiple benefit feature in there. And I think there's a big, big potential for that, unlocking a lot of funding, for example, through water companies. Um, I've already covered basically direct collaboration. So again, GIS platforms is essential. InfoWorks effectively is a GIS platform with a physics engine underneath it. It's a very powerful piece of software. And I think 
using that and translating that into a platform that's effectively online and in a way that multiple users can interact with in a way they understand is a very important piece of this equation um, as a, you know, beyond just the hydraulics. The other side of this again is, is the how you approach the assessment. And I mentioned a lot about policymakers and planners. Well, they're gonna look from the top down. You know, what do we need to do for a whole catch? And what do we need to do to achieve a target in 25 years? But at the same time, and working with colleagues in Enfield and, and Lambeth, there's always going to be those unique individual projects on site, say a project being delivered by urban regeneration or some highway improvement works or improving cycle access, cycle roads. Those projects still may have value in terms of flood benefit. So the ability to find sites individually and then do a bottom up assessment to go, what does that deliver me? And if that suddenly delivers extra benefit for, say, the water company, then that provides a link to be able to see if there's any mutual benefits and that might help improve the funding environment for delivery of those kind of features um which yeah so i've kind of sort of this i've already said that there um yeah and ultimately one thing and there has been some discussion um very high level discussion following the original work we've done but i could see true value in taking this to the next stage again and effectively providing some form of um, strategic assessment like this at a london scale um and this really captures the fact that Borough, borough scale works uh, on an administrative level, but obviously water does not follow borough boundaries. There's always going to be the interconnection. I already mentioned the combined system effectively cuts across underneath everything. There's only one uh, company that covers, covers the drainage system, so there definitely is collaboration needed at a larger scale. Um, so there's always opportunity to grow it beyond just doing these individual areas. Obviously, appreciate everything comes with money, cost and effort. But ultimately, if you get this environment, this holistic environment, and the ability to do those top-down and bottom-up bottom -up assessments, I think that is a major step to enable to be enabling continuous investment in retrofit and really get this ball rolling. Right, thank you very much. I've finished my my talk, and I will I will hand that back to Ruth. Thank you very much, Simon. That was a really comprehensive description of something which is obviously quite complex. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, as expected, there is uh, quite a lot of questions that have come in. So I will ask you some questions. In some cases, I've sort of amalgamated uh, a couple of them together because they were they're sort of, uh, you know, un under a sort of broader um, headline, if you like, uh, in order to let us get through them. So. Um, if I can just ask you a couple of these. So uh, first question, uh, how were the SUDS features represented in the model? You've talked about um, the sort of volume in the area, et cetera, but could you give us a little bit more detail about, about how they were represented and, and basic thoughts about what type of SUDS um, structure might be uh, selected for which site? Yeah, so they were modelled um, very simply um, on purpose, uh, as, I, as I alluded to. In the previous the pilot project, we did a bit more um, we did a few experimentations with, with different types of modeling, but for these studies, because of the sort of constraints of the project and the need for simplicity, we modeled them very simply, largely, um, largely to, you know, make sure it was quick, make sure it was speedy, we didn't want things being slow. So the assumption we made was that the features would effectively collect water from the highway, they would fill up, and after that they would no longer be of use for collecting water because they're effectively, you know, saturated, they're full. Um, so they were only modeled as a, as a node, as I said, when the area gives you your volume. And they were just connected with, with, with weirs, so simple weir records, which represented, um, I guess, a lot of these features are connected by uh, little drop curves, you know, a couple of drop curves or something. So you connect them by those to the highway carriageway that's represented in the model, and that just allows the water to flow over the weir, fill it up, but once it's full, the water doesn't go there anymore, it can continue on to the next one, or go down the gully that's next to it, or something like that. So that's, that was generally the approach to, to modeling them and keeping them simple. And okay. we actually, um, for, for the, we did look at doing different types, but ultimately I think in the model, it, they're all modeled the same. They're all just a, a sort of volume, a size, um, which just represents a, a, an area of pavement that you could build suds. And that, cause that's cause those suds op opportunities could be a, a bioretention feature. It could be a swale. It could be a street tree with a, you know, sort of storage area underneath it. It could be any of those. So we really focused on just working out a volume that we could then associate with a with a benefit 
and then in the calculations we did some work on what that cost would be you know, depending on what type of feature it was excellent thank you very much um uh, another question um how was the highway surface included in the model and were any automated processes involved uh yes and lots um so <laughs> the the key the key part of, of this was to include the highway network as i said a lot of the water on on these lower events will pool accumulate and travel on the highway before it gets into the ground one way or another so we used os open data which is luckily for uk based um consultants that's freely available so it's a very powerful data set um we then we did, did some work on it to improve the the accuracy so it's got sometimes you've got hundreds of meters between nodes so you create extra nodes so you can kind of follow the shape of the road um, like I said before in the, in the, in the call, we, um, we interpolated ground levels from the LIDAR, it's pretty easy. We developed um, shapes which represented um, pavements, the kerb, slight camber of the road on the other side. Our widths were adjusted based on master map, so we actually had some GIS processes that would then use a sensor line, go across it, and then basically calculate how wide the road is at that point, because it does obviously vary a lot. So we had a reasonable representation of the the effective capacity of the roads before it would you know flood beyond beyond that width of the road um, and then yeah the actual import and mill build we, we had quite a lot of gis um, automation in there to make that all happen in, in arcgis before we imported it all brilliant you've actually answered some of the other questions that came in with that oh, okay. with answer so that's good um another question is what's the value of assessing retrofit suds at large scale as opposed to detailed local evaluations well, I think the, I think the point is that what we've been doing is not is not um, supplanting the need in many cases to do a bit more work in local areas. The, what we we are still we are still focused a bit more, I guess, around master planning, you know, catchment planning. It is still to really identify opportunity sites and to almost focus the effort. Once you get into those streets, there's always a, there's always another level to work out what to do. We, you know, we've got the perpetual challenge of utilities. Which you know, no one you don't really know until you get to you get to site, to be honest. And all these components and access and, and land ownership and things like that that we we basically focus on saying there's a segment of street, say 50 meters long, 100 meters long, and in that segment of street, if you were to deliver a certain proportion of infrastructure, so say you know 50 square meters worth of, of retrofit suds, your benefit is going to be something like this, and you're going to realize it over there. That's really what you focused on. It's not to say that after that you just go and build it you're going to have to go down again and look at it in more detail but it's really to focus that first step where do you look across a whole catchment and it's yep. not about detailed assessment which is still very valuable and essential in many cases that needs to be done um yep that, well. perfect um uh, another question i'm just looking at the time um how can you extrapolate this um idea nationally <laughs> how much money do you have <laughs> um, well, effectively, as I, as I alluded to at the very end, um, we've been going down a route of trying, again, simplify the methodology far enough to make things easier to develop, quicker to run and to evaluate, but obviously not too far that we start to lose the granularity of, of what we're doing in this assessment. Um, so I think we've reached about an optimal level, I think, in what we've, what we've done in, in the places in London. Mm -hmm. So conceptually, if you have the drainage network of your urban environment, environment wherever that is in, in the UK, which we pretty much have most of them now, at least the foul combined networks. You have access to OS um, open data for the whole country, so you have your road network. Everything else you can generate itself. There's lots of automated ways you can create subcatchments and connect your, your systems. So I think fundamentally, there's nothing objectively, technically stopping this becoming a national wide, you know, nationwide sort of process, so to speak. Um, I would say that I don't necessarily think it needs to be quite that scale because different you know, boroughs don't necessarily need to compare against each other directly to deliver, but they need, it needs to be focused on communities and, and settlements, I think, like connect, connectivity of settlements and the hydrological catchments around them. So I think in London, for example, if we were going to do it at a scale, I think I worked out that probably be five catchments you'd do, you'd probably split it into five, which split the hydrology and the, the buried drainage system into, into natural groups. So I think mm -hmm. other places could do that, but conceptually, no reason why this wouldn't be applicable anywhere. Perfect. 
Okay, and um, it's a question relating to um, actually, well, I'll just read the question out. What, what proportion of SUDS opportunity sites identified via automated processes proved to be undeliverable due to site conditions such as utilities, traffic flow needs, and car parking constraints? To be honest, I don't know. <laughs> that's, okay. that's beyond me and what we've, uh, what we've got as far as in, in, um, in this work. And as I said a second ago, utilities is the white elephant a little bit in the room that does stop a lot of this getting done at scale. Um, but yeah, we've, we've not touched on that. Yeah, I guess that's something maybe that can be revisited um, in time. Um, another question that came in is whether you had considered um, using a cloud resource to run the, the models um, in order to uh, reduce the, that sort of runtime challenge. Yeah. Yes, of course, that, that's the, altern the alternative way to do it, is to increase your processing power, and not necessarily decrease your modeling complexity. So I would say the, the practical element of it is given the constraints of the projects, i programs and costs and things, that wasn't a tenable option for us. Um, but definitely it is a strategy that could be employed to do things differently. The flip side, though, is it, if you do so for example, if you wanted to do 1D, 2D integrate modeling and then use a cloud resource to run lots of simulations, that's fine, but you do generate significantly more data anyway. So the actual processing side of everything will get even more complex. So you could probably do it and admittedly you'd use the cloud to do that as well, but it might be one of the things where you start chasing efficiency by doing more and more work and it getting more and more complicated. Um, but I think conceptually, yes, of course it could be done. Um, we just didn't. That wasn't an option for us, but um, yeah, I'd be interested to see other people try that method. Um, I'm going to, I've got two, well, I've got loads more questions, but I'm going to just pick two because I am very conscious of time. Um, one of the questions was related to, uh, you know, looking at the water quality and being able to trace back. Um, was anything done in terms of that? Because obviously the, the sort of water quality um, benefits of yeah. SUDS is, is quite key. No, but... One of the reasons for the last few slides and the, 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 the approach to what I guess they call the deterministic modeling, which might not necessarily be the right term for it, but my, my attitude towards it and what I'm now pursuing to see if there's opportunities to do this is, is around using that connectivity to connect other beneficiaries, other values of the benefits to, to what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the previous project, the, the pilot study, we did a lot of natural capital assessment um, which was just done at a sort of high level, a, a generic level, and almost used to understand your cost benefit for water versus your cost benefit if you include the other features of you know, green infrastructure. But there was definitely a, an outcome that we were, we were wondering whether we can include the spatial variability of your natural capital components as well, whatever that is, you know, think, you know, and that includes water quality as well as a lot of other, other you know, very valuable, um, valuable metrics. So this was definitely focused on flooding. That was the remit of what we had in terms of the, the constraints. But I think going down a more uh, you know, deterministic route towards the sort of digital twin environment, if you do it that way, that probably gives you a better environment to be able to start connecting in other spatial benefits to what you're doing. And then to uh, an example being, going back to the previous one, you know, if, if the water company wants to address a CSO and they said, oh, that's fine, click on the CSO, it shows them their catchment, it shows them a few areas of communities that there's the best place to invest in this but then also you click on the you select those communities and then that then further on connects downstream or somewhere else to other benefits so the example being uh, water quality so that could show you which rivers which water bodies would then suddenly benefit so that would drag for argument's sake the environment agency into the discussion around funding as well as the water company and the local authority so i i can see that environment being a much better environment to bring people together and to connect all these different things up and not just have it flooding. Brilliant. Um, I think I'm going to leave the questions there because it's uh, four minutes before the hour. Um, really, really appreciate that, Simon. That was that was brilliant. Really, really interesting. Um, we've got one quick poll, the second poll, um, which if you would like any um, information demos, please use the chat, not the Q&A, but the, the chat box, which is uh, accessible at the bottom of this page. Um, all that's really left for me to say is to, to thank all of you for attending. Um, obviously, if you've got further questions after this, you can contact uh, myself or Simon after, after the event. Um, 
and to thank you, Simon, for a really, really great, interesting presentation. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you, everyone, for listening.